welcome. The reason we're here is over the last oh, four or five years, we've been, as we're working with clients, we're just seeing this big episode of falls. And we're seeing, um, gee, what's a way we can prevent some of this? You know, these injuries that occur. So tonight, we wanted to do this presentation as a way to say, look at pre prevention, because prevention is the game, and also heighten your awareness of what you can be doing for yourselves to prevent falling. So the question is, are you steady on your feet? I can go oh, this way. How's that? Better? Oh, I don't know. I'm I don't know. Are you guys better? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, I'll do it. I think it'll be easier. Okay, okay. so our objectives of tonight is looking at, um, to demonstrate the understanding of the rationale and the purpose of balance assessment and training, recognize current statistics associated with balance, identify and describe components of balance, increase awareness of common causes of balance impairments, list possible solutions for improved balance, provide resources for community activities which may assist in keeping individuals steady on their feet. So the question is, really, what is balance? It's the ability of the body to be oriented in space and to be maintained in an upright posture under various conditions and, of course, to be able to move without falling. So balance is the greatest when we have our center of gravity maintain over a base of support. So, balance requires the body to respond to internal and external disturbances. So, internal disturbances can be from disease processes, muscle weakness, uh, external disturbances is looking at if you're walking in a mall and somebody all of a sudden bumps you, you know, can you handle that? or um, walking on an escalator, getting on and off an escalator. So it's just looking at <clears throat> what's coming on internally as well as what's a force externally. And in that process, the body wants to definitely realign. And the third part is that interaction is always supported between the nervous system and the musculoskeletal systems. So here's a nice little overview of looking at how the balance interacts with the different systems between your nervous systems, your musculoskeletal system, and contextual effects such as what your environment offers you, icy conditions, your, what type of support surface, what's gravity doing on you, lighting, and how the nervous system creates all this sensory coming in and then your body through the muscle skeletal system responds to that sensory via from the cognition. So looking at statistics, national statistics show that percent of people falling increased from 40 to 65 to 85 percent after the age of 65. 20 to 30 percent of people who fall suffer between moderate to severe injuries including lacerations, head, head injuries, hip fractures. 40% of seniors nationwide who are hospitalized due to a fall related injury are unable to return home. CDC estimates, estimates one third of skilled nursing facility admissions are due to falls with 25% seniors with fall related hip fractures requiring, requiring at least one year. It happens here. <clears throat> so with Alaska, Alaska Population Projection Study reports anticipated population increase of people 65 plus will increase by 86% by 2045. The Alaska Trauma Registry Study, and this is very fascinating, <clears throat> excuse me, 2009 to 2013 reported that falls were the leading cause of non-fatal injuries with 25 and plus age and leading cause of fatal injuries with those 75 and older. The cost of medical expense for the hospitalizations was over $10 million. In 2015, 
164 falls that required hospitalization occurred in Fairbanks area alone for people ages 50 and over. And of course, the largest types of falls in Alaska includes the slipping, tripping, stumbling, um, falling on stairs. So those numbers should, you know, are kind of high and sad. So here's a couple slides. Are you at risk for increased falls? So what it's saying, first one, if you fell in the last year, you're at a five times greater risk to fall to happen again. Now, let's say you have weakness, or let's say you have perif peripheral not neuropathy, numbness of the feet. Your sensation's gone. And if you fell, now you added, now that's eight times. Let's say you used an assistive device like a cane. So then, now you added another 2.6. So each of these epi um, factors, as, as you add them in, I mean, it raises pretty significant risks for falls taking greater than five medications at a time. So looking at balance, there's four major components. Visual system, the vestibular system, somatosensory system, and the nervous, central nervous system. Tonight, this is an overview. I am not going, I do not have the time to go over specifically real detailed about each of these systems. So I just want you to know that this is just a quick, fast overview. Just put everything in perspective. <laughs> so looking at the visual system. So the visual system, sorry, provides information regarding, first of all, the position of the head in relationship to your environment. The orientation of the head to maintain a level gaze the direction and speed of what your head, the head movements. So as visual stimuli can be used to improve a patient's stability. So a lot of us use vision more than what you realize. So when your somatic sensory, which is your proprioceptive, your joint receptors, or your vestibular, your inner ear, if it's not reliable, then what you'll tend to do is really fix on your gaze on something, an object, something to give you that sense of stability. So I'm sure we've all had this kind of experience. You're sitting in your car at a stoplight, and you're looking ahead, and then all of a sudden, you're peripherally, you catch a car moving, and you're kind of like freaking out because all of a sudden you're thinking, am I moving? Or, or is it, what's going on? And then you kind of turn and you look and say, okay, no, I'm stationary, it's just a car moving on. So that's conflicting. So what's happening, those, your, your vision and vestibular, everything uh, is, is creating a conflict with one another. So you become disoriented. So then, then by looking out at somewhere else to give you that gaze stabilization, then that helps kind of say, okay, I'm safe, I'm not moving. I, might, I didn't let my brake off, right? I'm still <coughs> holding my brake and I'm safe. So gaze stabilization controls the direction of the eyes and maintains visual um, acuity during um, activities involving head and body movements. So if you will all be entertain me as I entertain you, we're going to do a little activity sitting here. What I'd like for you to do is take a finger and just put it out in front of you. And what you're going to do is you're going to only turn your head 30 degrees as you keep your eye on the finger. You have to make sure it stays focused, all right? So as you just kind of turn, can you keep it? Can the eyes track and keep it in good um, vision, clear, okay? Now, to make it a little bit harder, oh no, we're not done, hang on, <laughs> hang on. All right, let's see if I can explain it. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna turn your head to the left and then your finger goes to the right. And as your finger goes the opposite direction, you're gonna turn your head. And try and reverse that. And then of course, now think about speed. Can you do it faster? But you, ought, you gotta keep your finger, you gotta keep your eyes on the target the whole time. So here, this is gaze stabilization, this is VOR. So you have to be able to keep your eye on that target the whole time. If you can't do that, you have an issue. Mm -hmm. 
So the road to balance, we found this um, picture on the Vestibular Disorder Association, which I thought just was a nice caps, uh, encapsulates everything. So you have your proprioception, which is your, the purple. So that's your muscle, joint, skin. You have your visual, which is the gold, is your eyes, and then you have gravity. So you have on the left-hand side all the sensory input coming in. So the muscles tell the brain, you know, where, where it's in space. Your eyes, the coordination of your eyes is telling your brain what's going on. And then you have your inner ear that defines linear movement or rotation movements. And then it goes into the brain, the brain simulates it all, and then it, uh, it provides that information of what you need to do to respond to it. So whether it's turning the head, whether it's a depth perception change, all of that affects and incorporates into balance. So it's a very, very complex system, very. It's not that easy. So our next system, is looking at vestibular. And this provides information regarding the position of movements of the head in respect to the gravity and inertial forces, as well as the communication with the central nervous system. So in the inner ear, you have two systems. You have the ultis, if I can say it right, uricle and sacul, which is the, I wish I had a point. I do have a point, right? Does this work? No. Okay. So it's inside the, the big blue bubble, not the cochlear, but you have the canals, which are semicircle, which I'll discuss next. Anyways, so where the canals come in to this balloon or middle part, that controls your static balance or your linear position or your postural sway. I mean, it's just, it's the head, it's slow motion. It's really slow. So it can tell. It tells the brain right away what you're doing, if you're shifting a little bit. Then your semicircle canals provide a dynamic balance control, which is movement. This system activates um, with fast head movements, such as walking, or if you trip or you fall, anything fast. I don't know if you've heard of BPPV, or, or when you're in bed and you turn over and you get really dizzy or you feel like you're spinning. Have it, has any of you guys had any of that experience? Okay, so you've heard about the crystals in your head, okay, that get, or in the ear. So it's in these sacs that the crystal can get lost and can create that dizziness. And then there's a maneuver to help maneuver, to get it back in place. But I wanted you to just kind of see, so that all affects how, you, how you're balanced. Then the other system, besides those two, are your eyes. So how your vestibular um, interacts with your, with your eyes, and it's called a vestibular ocular reflex. So these receptors don't work alone, like I just listed, and they're unable to distinguish between nodding the head versus the head movement um, with the trunk, with like bending over. So to differentiate, you use your eyes to tell the brain, okay, oh, okay, I'm bending over versus, okay, I'm just nodding. So the, so the inner ear can't distinguish that, but your eyes are telling your brain, okay, this is what I'm doing. So as you see, it sends that impulses, the eye continually adjusts, and then it coordinates with body movement. Now I'm gonna pass the mic on to Heidi. All right, so, now, can you hear me okay? I have a loud voice. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the somatosensory system. All right, so the somatosensory system provides information to the brain about how and where our body is positioned, okay? So there's a couple different uh, receptors that we have with, that go along with that system, and it's the proprioceptors and the exterior receptors, okay? So proprioceptors are found within the muscles and the joints, and what they do is they track our body position uh, and they respond to our position and movement um, and, and help us figure out spatial awareness, okay? Um, if you didn't have working proprioceptors, it would be almost impossible for you to know how to eat. And what I mean by that is that you wouldn't know how your arm or your hand is moving towards your mouth, 
Okay? You would literally have to watch your hand move towards your mouth to be able to put food into your mouth. Same thing uh, if you were walking. If you didn't have any proprioceptors, you would not know where your foot is landing or where it is positioned in space. Okay, so they're very important to us. Exterior receptors, uh, on the other hand, react to outside stimuli. Okay, so they gather information like touch, um, pressure, vibration, sound, um, temperature. Okay, that's what exterior receptor is what they gather from, uh, from outside. And here's a fun fact. In each of the soles of your feet, you have about, well, be anywhere between 100,000 to 200,000 exterior receptors, okay? Um, what they do is they provide the brain information um, on how to make adjustments to gait or movement to adjust for um, different surfaces or ice or things like that. Okay, so they're important too. So, as far as the somatosensory system goes, posture is a really key component to it. Okay, so one goal of balance, if we remember back to the beginning, is to keep our center of gravity, which for most people is right here in the middle, um, with safely within the base of support, so where your feet are positioned, right? Um, Posture is also standing with the body in nice, tall alignment. So if you look at the picture to the left-hand side, good posture. If you had a plumb line, you'd be um, nice and straight and tall. Couple <laughs> posture deviations, starting to round the back, hips come forward. That's a little outside of our, our uh, center of gravity goes outside of our base of support. Okay. So maintaining optimal alignment or optimal posture helps us stay balanced, but it also doesn't make us expend as much energy. So that's a, that's a positive thing too. How many of you guys remember being told, sit up straight? Sit up straight. Hey, they were right on. Mom, dad, you should, they piano had it. Piano teachers, how many of you have ever played piano in here? Anyone? <laughs> Do you remember the teacher? Up, 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 up. I remember that, right on my back. Okay. So, I would like you to indulge me, and you don't have to do this activity. In fact, if you would like to do it seated, you may, but I need you, if you are seated, to uncross your feet if you don't want to stand up. So, if you want to do the standing version of this activity, go ahead and stand up for me. Cheryl, yes, my model Cheryl over here. And, and again, if you want to stay seated, that's fine. If you can uncross your legs, you can still do um, the majority of the activities, okay? So, we're going to practice optimal posture, all right? So, what I would like you to do is I would like you to stand with your feet hip width apart. And I mean hip joint, okay? So, my, I, if I stood with my hips where they are on the outside, my base of support would be too wide. So, I want you to bring them in to the hip joint, okay? And it can be in between hip joint and shoulder joint. So if you're somewhere in, in that range, that's good. If you're seated, same thing. I just want you to line your hips with your knees, with your, with your ankle or feet, and that would be okay, okay? Number two, I want you to feel the balls of your feet and your heel, and I want you to really slightly weight shift back and forth so you kind of get the feeling of balls of your feet and your heel. We all have that. Oh, you're on an incline. Oh, know, on so an incline. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So you're. Are you? Are you? Are you <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank yeah. you for. I just, you know what? Thank you for telling me that. Make now, sure you have good toes. Good now toes. Now your your proprioceptors and your exterior receptors are working overtime. Okay, so this is this is a good challenge for you, actually. All right. So on that incline, what I want you to do is kind of balance yourself between the three points. Even, even on an incline, you can find that balance between the three points, okay? All right, number three. What I want you to do, seated or standing, is pull your arches <coughs> up. Pull your arches up a little bit. Still maintaining that three-point balance. Are we all there? We all get where I'm going? So pushing your toes in to pop kind of it up. Pushing your toes in, drawing your arch up. Okay, and just do the best you can. It's just practice, okay? Number four. Okay, what that does is that should have activated some inner thigh. I mean, can you feel your inner thighs 
working a little bit, okay? So we've got some, some good work going down in your lower, lower legs, right? All right, so continuing on. I want you to give me a little bit of a glute squeeze, okay? A glute squeeze. Your glutes buttock. are your buttock muscles, okay? So the backside, right? Was that, say that again? Release the arches. Nope. Everything's gentle, building up. building up, if you can do it. And if you start to get tired, you start to feel not so great, you can sit down. It's okay. All right? So we've got a little squeeze. So now we've got balance between the three spots. We've pulling, pulled up in our arches. We've got inner thigh activated. We've got our glutes going. Okay? Now I want you to think about drawing your lower abdominals up. Okay? Draw it up. Okay? Not so that you can't breathe, it's just a little bit. <laughs> oh. let it, I'm just kidding, don't let it all go yet. Okay, not that you can't breathe, but just a nice gentle drawing up of your lower abdominals, okay? All right, moving on, I want you to think about lifting your chest up, lifting your sternum up, okay? So now we've got everything activated, lower extremities, lower body. Now we're lifting our, extremity, uh, our chest up because what that does is that straightens out your back a little bit and drops your shoulders. Now I need you to knit your rib cage back down. So what have we got going on? We've got our three-point stance. We've got our arches pulled up. We've got active inner thighs. Are you breathing, Cheryl? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Whew. Active inner thighs. We've got a little bit of a glute squeeze. We've got Lower abdominals pulled up. We've got a nice straight back knitted down rib cage, which by the way, now you're activating your core because you've just brought everything back down, okay? And I now want you, all you to do is lengthen out through the back of your head. So you feel like... So you feel like if Cheryl, well, we won't pull the back of her hair, but if she had a pretend piece of string... Puppet. ...attached <laughs> to the back of her head and I was pulling her up like a puppet, she would wow. lengthen out, okay? So how do you feel? This is optimal posture. And even in a seated position, you can practice optimal posture. Now everybody just let go. <sighs> see how you fall. <laughs> see, see Where how you, you collapse fall. to. Okay, now, if you don't remember any of that, <laughs> which is fair, okay? If you don't remember any of that, all I want you to do, you think about your favorite smell. My favorite smell is coffee in the morning. Can I get a yes? How many of you love coffee in the morning? Okay, so that is gonna be the example that I use. All I want you to do, you ready, Cheryl? What's your favorite smell? Coffee. Coffee, okay, here we go. All I want you to do is take a nice deep inhale, lift your chest, smell the coffee, lengthen out your neck, and there you go. Without lower extremity activation, you are back into that nice tall posture, okay? Are we all good with that? How do you feel after you stood in nice tall posture? After a little while, heat starts coming up, right? Okay, go ahead and sit down. Thank you for indulging me with that. I appreciate it. Okay. So posture is key. Posture control is key especially for the somatosensory system. And we'll talk about a little bit more in a little bit what that means for changes over time as we get older. So the last system I want to cover is the central nervous system. And again, this is a brief overview. There is a lot to the central nervous system and this is just touching the, the tip of it, okay? So the central nervous system um, provides sensory processing, okay? Um, tells us what our body is doing in space via the visual, vestibular, and somatosensory systems, okay? It's important for linking those sensations to our motor response and how we respond to different um, uh, terrains or, um, what's another word I'm looking for? Ambient um, environments, okay? And then it also helps us with motor strategies for, for planning and programming for balance response, okay? So what happens, and this is the control center of the body, and so what happens is all those um, systems send its information to the brainstem, and that brainstem interprets it and integrates it and sorts it, and it adds learned information from the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex. 
Okay, so the cerebellum provides information um, that you learn with repetition. So if any of you play the piano, that learned repetition, or serving a tennis, uh, tennis ball, or even walking, okay? Or even balance to some extent. It's a learned um, yeah. motor response. Um, the cerebral cortex, on the other hand, uh, gives information about things that you learn from perhaps the environment, like if you're walking on ice, we learn that we need to walk carefully or what happens. We, well, I have slipped and fall on the ice, straight on my back, so I have learned from that mistake and won't do it again, so I walk carefully, right? So if you look at this great visual, and it kind of go, goes back to what the, the visual that sh uh, Cheryl showed you, okay? It is a very complex system that works in and out with each other, together. Um, sensory input to integration input to motor output, and what does that give you? It gives you a very complex balance system, okay? So, we do take for granted um, good balance, don't we, a little bit? I did when I was walking on the ice. I took for granted. Some people um, don't have a problem with transitioning from grass to gravel or walking across a dra gravel driveway or getting up in the middle of the night and going to the bathroom without stumbling and falling, okay? Um, but with impaired balance, those activities can be frustrating. They can be um, fatiguing, okay? If you're, if you're really working hard to stay balanced, it can be fatiguing and it can also be kind of scary. All right, so impaired balance can happen in any of those four systems. Uh, it can be affected by injury or disease, uh, and it can be affected by aging process. So some of the pathologies that we're going to talk about, and we won't, again, this is just a, thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> this ranges from uh, ear infections, minor ear infections, to something more systemic and traumatic. So, Thoracic kyphosis, changes in skeletal system, peripheral neuropathy, muscle weakness, joint instability, TBI post-concussion, balance disorders, multi-medication um, disorders, Parkinson's disease, labyrinthitis, spinal stenosis, cerebrovascular accidents, middle ear infections, multiple sclerosis, and cerv uh, cervical spondylosis. So there are a multitude of reasons why pathologies or, or what can affect our balances as far as pathologies go. So when we're looking at uh, muscul musculoskeletal changes, uh, we look at several different things with this. Um, decreased range of motion in the neck, shoulders, hips, and ankles. Um, if you have loss of range of motion in your ankles, um, you're going to see, you're going to rely a lot on hip strategies. You may find that you walk a little bit more <coughs> bent forward, okay? Uh, if you have decreased hip range of motion, changes of center of mass, so we talked about center of mass wanting, wanting it to stay over our base of support. If we start walking forward, that center of mass comes forward, it changes, it affects our balance. And okay? there's our low back pain. And it causes low back pain. <laughs> so, so if you have decreased range of motion in your ankle, per se, you know, you need eight degrees of ankle dorsiflexion for gait and balance. If you don't have that, if you have restricted ankle motion, that can affect your balance. Um, here's another not as fun fact. Once we hit the age of 30, your strength your muscle mass will decrease by 10% every 10 years. So that means by Don't go there. 30 to 80, what's that? <laughs> I know. At the ages change. of 30 to 80, we're losing 30 to 50% of strength. So, and I'm in that, I'm in that category too. You know, we're, we're required to work a little bit harder to do a little bit more to maintain and build muscle mass and it could because it's important for balance and well-being okay the increased incident of foot deformities that has a 
plays a big role in balance. So if we are talking about claw toes, now if your, claw, if your toes are clawing, and, and mine are, okay? So if your, claw, your toes are clawing, your foot is gonna work much harder to stabilize. And what does that do? That makes your ankles seize up a little bit more. You lose ankle stability. What does that do to your hips? You rely on more hip um, strategies to, to take care of your balance, okay? So, in all, if we look at this, when we're looking at restricted activity because of weakness or changes in our feet or changes in our musculoskeletal sy system, um, if, we, if we go back, and we won't go back to this actual slide, but if you remember that slide that talked about what is your increased risk of, fa of future falls, if we're talking about weakness, that's, that's almost a four and a half mm -hmm. times risk, okay? So it's important, very important to main, maintain and build strength, okay? So another aspect that changes over time is our cognition. Um, increased uh, attentional demands. And what that means is that if you're trying to balance or if you're trying to walk or do something, and it can be static balance or dynamic balance like walking, um, and you add a motor task, like looking at my phone when I'm walking, or balancing, or talking to somebody, or talking on the phone, um, that can affect your balance. Um, go ahead and we'll talk about the next one. So decrease, so the more, the more your balance is affected, the less confidence you have, you're gonna have. And so that's kind of what this is saying. So go ahead and go to the next one. So psychological trauma or fear of falling or decreased confidence in your walking ability or balancing ability can actually cause a self-imposed activity restriction. I don't wanna go out and do things. I don't wanna go out and walk on ice in certain areas because I'm afraid I'm gonna fall. Okay, and that's a normal reaction to that, but what that does is it decreases your strength, it decreases your flexibility, it decreases your mobility, and it increases your future fall risk, again, to that four and, almost four and a half times. So another thing that you think about with cognition is changes to your environment along with cognition. Okay, so time constraints for ambulation. What that means, um, is if you are walking across a crosswalk and you see that little crosswalk numbers. guy and he's got the numbers up there and it says you got 10 seconds to get across the crosswalk, you're hoofing it. I mean, that's, it's a long ways, you gotta go fast. Maybe your spouse is saying, let's go. That can affect cognition. That can affect your fear, Balance. right? Right. <clears throat> Minimum walking distance. What if you can't walk as far as you used to be able to walk? So what does that affect? That affects your grocery shopping, right? Um, terrain characteristics, changes in terrain, carpet versus, and there's different kinds of carpet. So if we look at this carpet versus a shag carpet um, or a slicker linoleum floor, ice, navigating curbs, gravel, grass, okay? Ambient conditions, and that can be lighting. So in your folders, we actually added a home safety evaluation for you to take home and just take a look at what you're, what you're doing in your house. And, and that means we take a look at lighting, we take a look at if there's any rugs on the floor that, that are trip hazards, fall hazards, right? Um, but this can also, ambient conditions can also be weather, and we all know what it does here, but what do we wear in that nice cold weather? We wear big heavy boots, okay? Big heavy boots, what does it do? Well, it makes us clawed, right? We clawed a little bit more, we change the way we walk, it changes our posture, and that can cause some, some changes in your cognition or fear of falling. Phasic loads. So pushing and pulling objects, pushing a shopping cart, pulling a door. External loads, carrying groceries, and whether that's light or heavy, uh, carrying boxes, light or heavy, tools, light or heavy. And then traffic level. You have to navigate the traffic level, okay? So keeping you steady on your feet, how do we do it? Well, prevention is key, right? Prevention is a, is a huge deal, and it will really help. 
So you need to know when to see your specialist, and that means your doctor, audiologist, eye doctor, PT, OT, or even speech therapist. Okay? Increase your physical activity and do the things that you like to do. It doesn't always have to be going to the gym and doing this kind of stuff. It doesn't have to be that. You can do the things that you like to do, just do more of it. Challenge uh, cognition via dual tasks. Okay? Assess your home safety, and again, that goes back to the sheet that we have in your, in your uh, folder. And then improve your posture. So you all know now how to smell the coffee and get good posture out of that, right? So if you do decide to go to physical therapy, and we're actually gonna talk about our balance program here in just, uh, just a few minutes, uh, but general goals of physical therapy include increasing sensory organization and selection, improving gaze stabilization like you did earlier with Cheryl, increasing safety awareness and fall reduction through a lot of education, increasing physical activity levels, increasing functional independence and mobility, decreasing anxiety and stress, and increasing core and posture mobility and stability. So if you are at a loss of places to go or things to do as far as activity levels and increasing your activity levels, or if you're just not ready to go to PT quite yet, this is some, uh, just a few local resources um, that have some great exercise programs, activities uh, that you can get involved with. If you need more information, feel free to, to talk to me after and I can get that for you. Um, but the last thing on this list is the Foundation Health Partners uh, Rehabilitation Services Balance Screening, which Cheryl is gonna talk to you about. So thankfully, the administration of the hospital, we're all community-based, and we wanted to provide an opportunity for the community members to come and have a free screening. And this is very comprehensive. This is an hour-long screen. No cost to you, as I said, free. All you need to do is give our office a call at 458-5670, and it's in your folder as well, and just schedule an appointment. And what we do is we look at all the systems that we discussed tonight and we make sure that there's no deficits. And if there is a deficit, then we'll let you know and then you get to choose what you desire to do with that. Um, it's, you know, you can go back to your physician, you can get a referral, go somewhere else, I mean, wherever you want to go to address it. Our goal is prevention. Our goal is an awareness. So that's the whole purpose of the program. So, any questions? In the back. Oh, yes. Pam in the green. Lady in the green. Lady in the green. Oh, thank you. Do you do that vestibular uh, adjustment? Yes. Uh, yes. V V P P V. Yes. So the epley remove uh, maneuver. Yes. We do uh, work with vestibular issues. Sir. Um, do any of your patients or clients report back to you in a local Tai Chi group and uh, how it might help their balance? Uh, I would definitely recommend Tai Chi, but no, I, in fact we have referred others once they get to that point where they can progress to that level, I definitely do direct to Tai Chi. As a nice, slow, controlled, so you got movement and, st and stability at the same time. It's, yes, that's excellent. Do you recommend any program that can teach one how to fall safely? Oh, that is good. <laughs> that is good. Well, in therapy, yes, we can. You don't hear the question. What's that? Oh, she didn't hear? Repeat the question. She was asking that, is there um, a class or is there a service that can teach you how to fall safely? So the, our goal is this awareness is helping you understand where, where are we safe. So with the center of gravity, we want to get a nice base of support. If you are leaning forward to reach for something, how do we keep that center of gravity right in between versus, you know, the tumble over? Um, but yes, there are ways of doing floor recovery as well as working with that. Yes, sir. I don't think that's what she's asking. Oh, okay. Are you looking? Like okay. 
It's how is there a way to learn if you're falling, not how to prevent the fall, but okay, I'm falling. Correct. How do I, what do I do to minimize the damage? Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, yes, I, I, the nice thing is, is as you work on your strategy, because that's what it is, our body, for instance, as we do activities, one of the activities advances a braid. How to, in fact, I don't know, line dancing ladies, gentlemen, I don't know. But our body, when we start to lose our balance, we do a crossover effect. We have a riding reaction. But if our neck is really tight, if our eyes are limited, and our responses are slowed down because we, ha we just don't have that mobility, we need to gain it back. And that's the purpose of therapy, is to put you into these situations that make you use your body in a way that you haven't used it. So in that regards, I understand about how to fall. That's one way. As you work on these, on these exercises, you start working on those writing reactions Okay, so then as you fall, that's something that we can discuss even more by showing, okay, if you start to fall, a lot of people, it's such a reaction, you know, if you're going to go down, you're going to go down. If you can recognize your weight is in your back of your heels, which majority, that's what happens. As we get older, we get all of our weight into our heels. So now our toes are up, we're not using our toes, and so if you're doing a, a large step, and you're taking, you hit something slick, where are you going to go? You're going to go back. So what we want to work on is if you start and you can feel that, can you correct it? So again, it's helping your body to figure out, huh, okay, if I'm going here, you have the sensory to say, oh, I need to change and correct it. No. I know what you're saying. I know you want to know how do you fall. You can do a tumble effect. There is a tumble effect, right, where you do a collapse. What I'm saying, it depends on the type of fall. It's too variable. But yes, we can cover. We can we cover. A week ago Monday, mm -hmm. I fell down eight concrete mm -hmm. steps and landed on a concrete platform. I knew I was falling, and there's a little time to go down, bouncing down eight steps. <laughs> anything I can do in the process, I can't stop myself. Stay relaxed. Stay relaxed. Relax. Is there anything else that I can do? Is there only one thing? Or I think there's probably a lot of people in this room who would like to know what to do. Okay, I'm following. It's, it's not a boom. It's a, well, you do have that moment of, oh, please, Lord, don't let me hurt myself. <laughs> I mean, I, I, but I'm just saying that I think sometimes the, the more you can work on your writing reactions and get your body to respond, yes, you have a better chance to adapt. Um, there is no magic answer. Heidi, I'll let you. Do you have anything to add on that? About Don't balls? do that. I, and don't do that. Tuck and roll or relax. I was wrapped up. Exactly. Wow. Protect your head. Protect your head. That's one that would have helped. I didn't manage to get my hand back there. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Tuck and roll and protect your head and stay relaxed. That's what I would say. <coughs> yeah. Gentlemen? I have found uh, if you're falling backward and it's a parking area, it's clear, it's not a curb, or it's in the middle of the floor, or there isn't any obstacles behind you, then if you pull your head forward, and assume sort of a fetal position, so you sort of fall on your butt and roll right onto your back. You're spreading out the entire effects. I've even found it works if it's kind of quick and your feet go over the head and you do a somersault. Yes. You've actually <laughs> expended the entire thing throughout the body. That's a tuck and roll. <laughs> you bet. Yes, ma'am. This lady sitting to my left taught a class in how to fall for all of me. Okay. <laughs> it was based on a Feldenkrais teacher. Okay. All right. And it worked. It really, <clears throat> it takes practice. Okay. Well, that's good to know. So are you going to do it again? I think so. 
Awesome. I think that'd be great to get that publicity out to work on that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I admire all these people who know they're falling because I am pretty clunky and I usually find that I'm on the floor before I even realize. <laughs> I don't have some sensation of falling most of the time, but occasionally once I did and I end up putting my hand out and breaking my hand. But uh, most of the time I'm just shocked that I'm down because I haven't felt, you know, the dream sensation of falling or anything like that. I'm just down, so uh, I don't know if that's a, on your whole chart of conditions, if that's um, what one of the elements of balance that I'm lacking, but uh, I don't know. I think it would be interesting to know the techniques, but I don't usually know I'm falling until someone's saying, are you hurt? <laughs> Right. Well, and that's a lot of it is pretty fast. Um, you'd have to, so, you know, I definitely would recommend coming in for a screen to find out why. I mean, what, what's not connecting? What's going on? And again, and these are, you know, ways we use measured outcome tests, you know, that have been proven over to, to show these, some of these deficits that are going on. Um, but and if, and again, if it's something outside our realm, we definitely refer you back to your physician or we refer you to hearing imbalance. They have some, if it's, if it's a vestibular inner ear issue. But yeah. Actually, I had something similar to what the city had where I just stood up and next thing I was on the floor. And it turned out to be actually um, swollen tissue near my inner ear because, you know, you go to the dentist, you put in the filling, they check your bite when you're numb, okay? And I don't eat laying down, okay? I eat sitting down. So somewhere in my life, I must have had some accidents, and my little jaw must have slipped. But having, um, eating after the um, dental work was actually causing more pressure. But I didn't feel it when it turned out to be that. So I would recommend also consider male bites, you know, mm -hmm. and the bridges. And yes, TMJ, yes. Ask your dentist to have them do their imprint while their impressions while they're sitting up. Because I find that saves a lot of time for the dentist and a lot of time for me. So going back and saying, oh please, put your father, put your father, put your father. So true. Now I'm doing impression of the sitting up. <coughs> So you can see how multifaceted it is. I mean, so many different things impact, impact it. Yes, sir. Have you guys done any work with uh, people who have Meniere's disease? No, um, not but the audiologist myself. I was going to say, that would, would be the referral to the audiologist. <laughs> have you already seen the hearing imbalance folks, Dr. Hughes? No. That's who I would go to. She, she is with, uh, over at the Fairbanks, um, thank you, Medical Dental Arts Building. Yes. Um, next to Dr. Rogus. What's that? I have been over there. Um, go see her. She's back. She just moved back and she is really um, excited. Her whole focus is balance too. So we're doing a lot of collaboration with her as well. So I want, oh, go ahead, sir. When you're falling, is it better to risk breaking your wrist or arm as part of the uh, salvaging? Versus your head? To perhaps breaking a hip or injuring your back? That's a good question. <laughs> ah, you know. None of the above. None of the, None of the above. above. Yeah. Um, definitely, I would protect your head above all. Mm -hmm. That's your most important. You don't want to. You don't want a brain injury, and that's what happens. So with the Feldenkrais, so that's a lot of patterning. Correct? It's a patterning of movement that you're doing. It's a series of movements. Retraining reflexes. Correct. So your muscular memory can work because it works before your brain kicks in. 
that's what we do at therapy too. So yes, it's, it's working on how to activate all those systems to make it become an automatic system. Yes. Anybody else has a question? Yes. I'm not sure if the question is a comment. About 10 months ago, I discovered I had parathyroid disease, which was a tumor on one of my parathyroid glands that was taking calcium out of my bones and putting it into the blood. And that had been going on for at least 12 years. And the local doctor says, oh, then your bones have got to be very brittle. Don't you dare fall. I said, well, that's a comment. How in the world do you <laughs> Yeah, lovely, isn't it? <laughs> Good piece of advice. Now, no. <laughs> so, how have you handled it? <laughs> well, I, I have not fallen. <laughs> That's when I last fell, and I thought, well, probably some years ago when I was cross country skiing, I fell in the snow. But, uh, but I still go. Crazy. I was just going to ask, are you staying active? That's huge. That's huge. Staying active, keeping yourself strong, because all of that works those reactions. Is biking a helpful activity? Any activity is helpful. Anything to keep your muscles strong. One of the other factors, though, um, I'm going to add in is we lose, as we get older, what we call hip extension. So we start kind of kicking in with our hip flexors, and we kind of come a little forward, and our walk comes like this. Look like anybody? Okay. Normally, one of the biggest components that gets missed is that hip extension. And that's that toe push off and that's that butt working. That's something that I'd like to really encourage you each as you walk to kind of think about that to really help separate. Because the more you can separate, that keeps that center of gravity right in between you and it winds you out and it allows those muscles to stay strong, okay? But it's all part, if we stay here, our center of gravity gets shifted forward. And when we stand up, it should be right between the legs. So you need to really make sure you keep every muscle, every aspect of your body strong. Biking's great, but you gotta make sure you do something with extension, right? Something to bring that leg back. Cross-country skiing's great, but you gotta be careful that as you're doing it, that you're not staying too forward, that you're staying, you know, watch your posture. But that's one thing to think about when you're walking to really get that toe push off, to really think about what I always say, a bride walking down the aisle or a model walking down the walkway, but really get that hip extended. Sure. I'm okay. assuming when you talk about that, you're not talking about a long stride necessarily because not we a long down on our heels, but in terms of when you talk about balance and minimalist, you're coming down uh, more on the, the mid part of your foot. Still stay with the heel, but the problem is, is you're when you're shuffling and when you're kind of staying forward. Okay, you're coming on your heel, but you're, you're taking a larger step forward and you're not getting that step behind you. No, I want you to still, I want you to still hit your heel, but if you, if, you stay, if you stay upright and if you get away from this, if you stay up and you take and you put a heel out and you come forward, okay, and as you stand on the right leg, as you're pushing off, now make that left leg push you forward. And then that allows you, so you're going to keep your feet on a little bit longer and keep your toe helping more. Is that, so, so it is lengthening the stride, it is lengthening the stride a little bit. The stride, it's coming, but it's stepping forward, keeping up, and yeah. forward. Yeah. Okay. So there's a, so you can see the difference of here, here, and I never let my knee pass my hip versus bringing my hips forward more onto the leg. So what we do is we, we, short, we short our stance. We don't, we, we, we stand like this when we should be like this. And so that hips, if your hips are really tight, that's gonna really mess with you because then that causes your knees to get tight or your hamstrings to get tight. So this is our walk, it's pretty phenomenal how it works on balancing 
you have muscles working against each other so one can relax while the other one's activated and then that's how it works and then we forget to get that full extension all right Let's just have one more. oh yes something you said about the full extension i noticed um, that whenever friends and family um, are wearing like sneakers or hiking boots or such or going barefoot they have that long extension a uh, longer stride Thank you. And I've seen a number of my friends have accidents, break their wrists and their arms with these props. Yes. Even though they're comfortable, but they're not in attention. And when you throw them top that, they talking on the cell phone, you know, or texting while walking the top, they're asking for that. So what she's saying is how, you know, different shoes, you know, like we were talking about foot deformities, toe deformities. Um, I cannot stress enough, number one, if you're diabetic, I'm sure you've already been educated about making sure that your shoe is exercised. Number two, avoid any type of clog. Nothing, avoid shoes that um, have no back because then your toes are working trying to keep that shoe on so you can never get that extension. So even though they're easy and those bed slippers, you know, are so easy to put on, thank you. Those are detrimental. 